Welcome uh, again to the uh, School of Tyrannus uh, and our study of the Word of God in the book of Acts. And tonight is Halloween night, and uh, uh, that is uh, sometimes called the, the Devil's Night, but uh, uh, we're not going to let uh, uh, the devil have his way here. Uh, this is the Lord's uh, Night. And uh, we're studying His Word, and trust that the Lord will bless uh, our study tonight. Well, uh, we do have our uh, customary uh, Israel update, prophecy. Uh, what's happening in Israel, or concerning Israel today? Of course, <clears throat> most of the news um, these days is about our election here in the United States and uh, coming up next week. And of course, none of you will miss next week because of the election, will you? Um, at any rate, uh, <laughs> yes. I mean, the the uh, the polls close at seven o'clock p.m. So uh, be able to get here. Uh, at any rate. Um, there, there is activity uh, in Israel. There has been the uh, appointment of uh, the deputy prime minister, whose name is Lieberman, Lieberman uh, interestingly enough. And he is a right-hand man of Netanyahu, who is a uh, strong, um, uh, I guess we would call him a hawk uh, in Israel. And uh, strong uh, conservative, so uh, that might uh, be a beneficial uh, development in Israel. I've always felt better when uh, Netanyahu was uh, somehow involved in the government. Uh, he's uh, he's an excellent uh, elect excellent leader in Israel. Uh, there's been the uh, discussions in Russia. Maybe we discussed this last week. Uh, between Prime Minister Olmert and uh, President Putin in Russia, and they're talking about Iran and concerns about Iran. Uh, now, publicly, uh, Russia is not being very cooperative in that effort, but um, it's something like what we would expect as we move toward the setting of the stage for the Gog and Magog War of Ezekiel 38 and 39, where we have uh, Russia, Persia, which is Iran, and uh, several other nations gathering together against Israel to destroy Israel, to wipe Israel off the face of the map. And that's uh, exactly what uh, it seems that... Uh, Iran wants to do right now, or as soon as possible. Well, <clears throat> the, the good news is that the Lord wins that battle for Israel, and uh, that uh, somewhere in that mix, uh, the, the, it would appear that the rapture will occur. So the rapture of the church is imminent. He could come at any moment, and uh, we're certainly seeing... Uh, signs uh, toward the Gog and Magog War and the uh, and the Tribulation. Well, any other thoughts on uh, Israel update? Maranatha. Maranatha. Yes, that's Aramaic. And what does that mean? Yes, the Lord is coming, and. Uh, At one of our pre-trib conferences, uh, one of the speakers was talking about how he was teaching them uh, at a conference there on a, on a school campus uh, about Maranatha. And uh, uh, so he was saying that was the greeting that the uh, first century churches uh, people made uh, to one another. Uh, if 
if the person was not a believer, he wouldn't know what you're talking about. If he was a believer, he'd know uh, what Maranatha, the Lord is coming. Um, <clears throat> so he developed that and taught it, uh, about it for several days. And then he was walking across the campus and one of the ladies came up to him and said, Marijuana! <laughs> she didn't quite have it. <laughs> oh, me. Well, we are studying the book of Acts, and uh, we have come to the 11th chapter. And in the previous chapter, we had the uh, a stunning development of the salvation of Captain Cornelius, the, the centurion. And uh, the, that he was the first Gentile, along with his family and, and friends and so forth that were gathered there, uh, the first Gentiles to receive the Lord uh, in the church age. And uh, uh, they received the same baptism of the Spirit of God that the Jews had received at Pentecost. And they were baptized into the body of Christ. And uh, a, a whole new era had begun. And it was through Peter, who had the keys to the kingdom that the Lord had given him. He had opened the doors to the Jews. The Lord used him to open the doors to the Jews to receive the risen Christ and begin the church age. Then uh, to the Samaritans, he came and was used to open the door to them. And now, after several years, uh, he was used of the Lord uh, miraculously and a lot was going on behind the scenes uh, supernaturally. He, uh, Peter was used of the Lord to open the doors of the kingdom of God to the Gentiles. So now the Gentiles, along with the Jews and the Samaritans for that matter, we're now uh, able to be part of the ecclesia, the church, and the body of Christ. Uh, that, that was the significant thing about what we studied last week. But not everybody liked that. <clears throat> uh, there were those who were upset about what had happened. And... Um, uh, the people who uh, were upset about it uh, in the early part of uh, chapter 11, we already did this last week. Uh, and when Peter, verse 2, and when Peter came up to Jerusalem, those of the circumcision contended with him, argued with him, uh, were upset with him, saying, you... Went into the uncir uh, went into uncircumcised men. Went into their house and ate with them. Uh, what's wrong with that? But to them, it was it was it was devastating that their the the chief of the apostles had gone in uh, to the house of Gentiles and ate with them and, and conversed with them and so forth and so on. So, Peter gives his defense of, of what he had done. Now, why were they upset? What? Why would that upset anybody? Well, well, the food wouldn't have been kosher. The, uh, the, the food would not have been kosher, as you say. The, the, uh, uh, that was one thing. Well, <clears throat> uh, okay, so the Jews were not supposed to be, eat uh, unkosher food. Nor were Jews supposed to go into the house of a Gentile. Why not? Well, uh, it's not because they felt they were superior or something like that. Not because uh, uh, they, they felt that there was uh, uh, any distinction uh, one way or another. Uh, in many respects. However, what the problem was, was that if you go into the house of the Gentile, 
you are exposing yourself to idolatry. Because all the Gentiles they knew uh, were idol worshippers. Had statues all around. Uh, and, of course, they ate unkosher food. And so the temptation would be to go into idolatry and to go into unclean uh, food that the Lord had forbidden the Jews to eat. So, uh, this, is, this, is, this was the barrier. And remember, Paul in Ephesians tells us that the ordinances created the enmity. The enmity, the adversarial relationship between Jews and Gentiles. In, in a very real sense, the law of Moses created enmity between Jews and Gentiles. Why? Well, the Jews were being separated out. The, the, one of the main ideas of the law of Moses was to separate Israel from the rest of the world. They couldn't eat the kind of foods that the Gentiles ate. They couldn't work on the days that the Gentiles worked. Uh, they couldn't worship the, in the same way that the Gentiles worship. There are a lot of distinctions there uh, set up by the law to distinguish between the Jew and the Gentile. And it was the law that made the enmity. So <clears throat> here, here it's uh, reflected here. And they were just trying to follow the law. And, and, and they thought, well, I, I would imagine they said, uh, well, Jesus was a Jew. And he was circumcised. And he kept the law. And, and now you're telling us it's all right not to be circumcised for, for a Gentile to be a follower of Jesus and not be circumcised and not keep the law? What's a, what's a little wristband that uh, the kids wear? What would Jesus do? Well, what did Jesus do? Well, those are the things. some of the things that He did. And you're saying you can be a follower of Jesus and not be circumcised, not be Torah observant, not keep the law? And it didn't make sense to them. So, Peter reviews the circumstances by which he, as a Jew who believed in Christ, went into the house of a Gentile and ate with them for several days. Not just a quick snack. It was uh, several days that they stayed with them. Not only that, he took six other Jewish men with him from Joppa to Caesarea to do this. All right, so he was. Uh, we, we had uh, gotten as far as verse... 11 uh, in chapter 11 and at that very moment three men stood before the house where I was having been sent to me from Caesarea this immediately followed this remarkable vision that Peter had about the sheet that was lowered down with clean and unclean animals and he was to rise Peter, kill and eat. And he said, no, I'm not going to do that. I've never, never had any unclean food. But the Lord was teaching him that there was a, there was a dispensation, dispensational change here. There was a new thing in the world. And uh, these three men stood before the house where I was, having been sent to me from Caesarea. Then the Spirit told me, to go with them, doubting nothing. Don't be afraid. Don't doubt. Uh, these, these are, as they turned out to be, they were Gentile soldiers who had come. Uh, but he was, he was reporting that the Spirit of God told him to do that. Moreover, these six brethren accompanied me, and we entered the man's house. Wow. Uh, but being obedient now to the Lord, even though it appears to contravene the law of Moses. As he was going into a Gentile house and uh, going to be exposed to Gentiles, 
and to their food, which was something of an issue here with these people uh, who were raising the point. Uh, verse 13, And he told us how he had seen an angel standing in his house, who said to him, Send men to Joppa, and call for Simon, whose surname is Peter. Well, an angel of the Lord was in uh, Cornelius' house. And if it was okay for an angel to be in his house, it was okay for Peter to be in his house. I think that's part of the gist of uh, his argument here. Uh, who will tell you words by which you and all your household will be saved. So the the angel has taken the initiative here with uh, Cornelius, gone to his house, and said, you bring Peter up here and he will tell you how to be saved. With words. Now, that's, that's the way salvation comes. It comes by words. Faith comes by hearing. Hearing the Word of God. Now, to some people, that's foolishness. Uh, the foolishness of preaching. And yet, God has chosen to save people by the foolishness of preaching. By the foolishness, what appears to be foolishness, of speaking the Word. And that's what, and that's what Peter was called on to do. This Verse 15, And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them, as upon us in the beginning. In the beginning of what? Uh, is he going back to John the Baptist? No. Is he going back to the ministry of Jesus? No. He's going back to Pentecost. That's when the new thing began. The, the ecclesia, the body of Christ. The, the, new, the new man began. In the beginning. And uh, the same thing happened to these Gentiles as happened to us. Then I remembered the word of the Lord. How he said, John indeed baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So this is a new thing. This is a new ministry. This is a new beginning. This is a new dispensation. And it, it was initiated by the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit came down upon the believers in Jerusalem and they were baptized into the body of Christ. And the Holy Spirit uh, came upon them and, and, and as it were, they were immersed in the Holy Spirit. And uh, the, uh, this was a new beginning. And it was a, a totally new experience because now believers in this age are permanently indwelt by the Holy Spirit. That's one of the remarkable new features of our age. So... Now, then, then there's the clincher of verse 17. If therefore God gave them the same gift as He gave us when we believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could withstand God? He's almost making the argument, look, I didn't really want to do this. But I was pushed and shoved by the Lord every which way. And I had to be obedient to the Lord. And when I was... The same thing happened to these people as happened to us. And how can I argue against this? This was the act of God, just like He had done with us. And uh, so he, he he says, I, "I was I was pushed into this. I was forced into this. I was made to do this." And look what the Lord did. The Lord just did a marvelous thing, and He did exactly for the for these Gentiles as He had done for us. And I, 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 
when he showed me the sheet, I said, no, no, Lord. <laughs> uh, but how could I withstand the Lord now? How could I, how could I fight against this? This was God moving and I could not uh, operate against it. Well, uh, really, they didn't have a rebuttal for him. After all this, in verse 18, when they heard these things, they became silent. And they glorified God. Well, they weren't silent very long. But they were silent as far as arguing with, uh, with Peter. They were silent. And they glorified God, saying, Then God has also granted to the Gentiles repentance to life. Yes. Tom, uh, just think about uh, the in Jeremiah the new covenant. Was it with the with the uh, Peter and these guys be seeing the new covenant from Jeremiah being fulfilled here? Uh, the question is, uh, what were the apostles seeing uh, the new covenant being fulfilled here? There's quite a debate among theologians about uh, the new covenant. Uh, when Jeremiah prophesies the new covenant, he is speaking about the, the Spirit of the Lord coming upon the whole nation Israel and the whole nation Israel being transformed. And that is a, a part of the new covenant uh, that will come in at the end times. This seems to be uh, uh, an application of the new covenant in light of the fact that Israel did not receive the Messiah at His first coming. And so, uh, some might say, well, it's plan B. Well, uh, of course, the Lord knew all this all along, and He knew exactly what was going to happen. Nevertheless, the offer to Israel was real. The rejection by the nation was real. The acceptance by the, the remnant of Israel was real also. And... Uh, so we are engaged in the New Covenant. And the church is engaged in the New Covenant. And it is being applied to us. And the basis of the New Covenant was the shed blood of Christ. The basis of the covenant that the Lord has with the church is the shed blood of Christ. So we, we are ministers of the New Covenant, Paul says. And we participate in the New Covenant. But it is not uh, completely fulfilled in the sense of what Jeremiah was talking about. But will be. Will be. So, this is, the, the, the Lord's doing this. And you see, Peter had to be kind of pushed into this because he didn't have much revelation about this kind of thing. There was nothing about the church as such in the Old Testament. And so the Lord was uh, opening His eyes as He was, uh, in, a, in a sense, the Gentiles. Yes? Is this really a new covenant or just the fulfillment of what God started in the beginning? Of what, of what God started? In the beginning. You know, back, back when He uh, uh, gave Moses the law. Uh, because again, everything, types and shadows, look forward to that happening. So, is it actually a new covenant, or is it just a fulfillment of what was already uh, taking place? Well, there were there were types and shadows. Repeat, of, the, repeat the question. The, the question was: uh, Is this really a new covenant, or is it a continuation of the old covenant that was established back? Pardon? A fulfillment. Ful, fulfillment of the uh, uh, old covenant. <clears throat> well, there are two strings of covenants. There's the unconditional covenants uh, like the Abrahamic covenant and the Davidic covenant and the new covenant. These are unconditional. There are conditional covenants. There, there is the, uh, the law of Moses. If you do this, then you will be blessed. If you do not, you will be cursed. Those are conditional. And uh, the new covenant is in the stream of that flows from the Abrahamic covenant, which is unconditional. Ultimately, Israel is going to be saved. Uh, now, you had a lot of types and shadows in the Old, Old Testament, 
about the coming of Christ, the first coming of Christ, the, the sacrificial atonement of Christ, and so forth, the Passover and all of that. Uh, and the new covenant would be based upon that, upon the fulfillment of that, the, the sacrifice of Christ and His atonement. But, uh, the uh, the new covenant is an unconditional covenant based solely on faith and uh, will be applied to Israel in the Jeremiah sense but it will all, it is also being applied to us today I believe it is a, a, a new covenant it, it's in the stream of the Abrahamic covenant it is related to the Abrahamic covenant, but it is it is of a whole new nature. It is a new nature indeed, and as applied to the church, it's a, it's a whole new creation that was never prophesied in the Old Testament. Moses didn't know anything about the church. Jeremiah didn't know anything about the church. Isaiah didn't know anything about the church. Uh, this is a whole new ball game, as it were. And again, that's. I think that's why the apostles had to be kind of dragged, kicking and screaming a little bit into this uh, whole new situation because they had no previous revelation about it. And the Lord was opening their eyes and giving them direction step by step. Uh, and uh, that was certainly the way it was <laughs> with Cornelius. Uh, but now the, the, the door was open. The gate was open. But nevertheless, this issue was still an issue for several years until uh, uh, the 15th chapter uh, when we had the, the Jerusalem Council and then this matter was settled once and for all. But it was sort of partially settled at this point. Now verse 19. Now those who were scattered after the persecution that arose over Stephen, oh, that's going back to the seventh chapter, and who was in charge of that uh, martyrdom of Stephen? Saul. Saul of Tarsus, yes. Uh, after the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch. Uh, looking at some of the pictures in our uh, handout, we have uh, Peter in the house of Cornelius reviewed. We have the making of matzah, for instance, as part of the kosher uh, laws of the Jewish people. And um, we have the Roman soldiers. Uh, the centurions, such as Cornelius represented. And now we see here the map. Antioch was about 300 miles from Jerusalem. And uh, you see Damascus is uh, not quite halfway between the two. So Antioch was a fair distance away from Jerusalem. But also, uh, there was Cyprus and uh, Phoenicia. That's where Tyre and Sidon are. And they were preaching, to, preaching the Word to no one but Jews only. So you see, it hadn't filtered down yet that uh, it was possible for Gentiles to receive Jesus uh, like it was Jews. Uh, but some of them were men from Cyprus and Cyrene. Now that's a long ways away. That's in North Africa. Yes. Who, when they had come to Antioch, spoke to the Hellenists. You remember the Hellenists back in chapter 6? Uh, they were Jews who were Greek speaking, and they had adopted some of the Greek ways, uh, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned to the Lord. Presumably, mostly Jews here, if not all. Then news of these things came to the ears of the church. How do you like that expression? Came to the ears of the church. Now, in Jerusalem, and they sent out 
Barnabas to go as far as Antioch. They sent him on a 300 mile trip. And when he came and had seen the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged them all that with purpose of heart they should continue with the Lord. So he, he was uh, living up to his name, Barnabas, the son of encouragement. He was encouraging the church in Antioch. Now, now we'll see the word Antioch in a couple of places here in Acts. This is the Antioch in Syria, close to the coast. Uh, uh, at the northeastern corner of the uh, corner of the Mediterranean Sea, you see it up uh, up there, and it is uh, still there, and it's in Syria, modern Syria today, and it was in Syria back then. Uh, but it was a a leading church now uh, in this new age. Verse 24, For he, Barnabas, was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and a great many people were added to the Lord. Now that's that's quite a compliment, is it not? This is the by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, describing Barnabas as a good man. And it's also the writing of Luke. You remember that later on, Luke, uh, uh, Barnabas and Paul have a falling out. And... Luke was with Paul. So, uh, I think this is a, 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 a kind of a kind thing and a generous thing and a true thing uh, that Luke puts here about a good description about Barnabas. Then Barnabas departed to Tarsus to seek Saul. Now, there he was in Antioch. The church was growing. The church was uh, developing. There was something missing. It was teaching. The teaching of the Word. And he said, "What? where am I going to get a teacher to teach the Word here in Antioch? Oh, oh, I remember Saul of Tarsus. He was our enemy once, but now he's our friend. And he was preaching Jesus, the last I saw, but he's gone up to Tarsus. I don't know what Saul had been doing up there in Tarsus, his hometown, which was on the northeast corner of Turkey now, or somewhere about in here. But uh, Barnabas said, I, I'm going to go get Saul. Verse 26, And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. So it was that for a whole year they assembled with the church and taught a great many people. What were they doing? They were teaching. Teaching the Word. Teaching the Gospel. Teaching the uh, about Jesus. Teaching uh, all the fullness of the message of God. And so there was a need for the teaching of the Word. Um, do people still need that today? The teaching of the Word? Yes, we still need the teaching of the Word. And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Where did the name Christian come from? Well, came from Antioch. Now the debate is whether they call themselves Christians or others call them Christians in some kind of derisive tone. We don't know. But it's not a bad term. It means Christ followers. Uh, little Christs. Uh, anyway, anyway, identified with Christ. And it's not a bad, bad name at all. Verse 27, And in these days, prophets came from Jerusalem to Antioch. See, now these were the two big cities now with uh, active churches, Jerusalem and Antioch. And they sent prophets down to Antioch. Then one of them, named Agabus, stood up and showed by the Spirit that there was going to be a great famine throughout all the world, which also happened in the days of Claudius Caesar. 
That was in the 50s, I believe. Uh, and uh, he was one of the wicked Caesars. But there was going to be a great famine to come over the whole Roman Empire. So, uh, then the disciples each, according to his ability, determined to send relief to the brethren dwelling in Judea. This all, they also did and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. Well, that would make a good place for us to take a break. And uh, we'll come back and talk about it in a little bit. And now we will uh, have our break. But who will uh, do our interview? Dr. Tommy Ice. Dr. Tommy Ice, uh, one of the leaders of the pre-trib uh, study group, has a conference in Dallas every uh, year, and uh, that's a very interesting interview. We hope you'll Just, enjoy uh, that Our web students have enjoyed the uh, class, uh, the inter interview with uh, Dr. Tommy Ice. That was a very interesting interview, and he's a very interesting person and Christian leader. And we are back now uh, at the uh, School of Trans. I believe we have a question from the, our web students. Yes, Tom, Barbara Lewis wanted, was asking, when was it that the disciples brought the people and taught them on the first day of the week? <laughs> That's what she <laughs> can, can you repeat that again? <laughs> when was it that the disciples brought the people and taught them on the first day of the week? Yeah. Uh, the question is, uh, when did the disciples first begin to... Uh, teaching the people and bringing them together on the first day of the week, I assume as, a, as distinguished from the Sabbath, the seventh day of the week. Uh, I believe this uh, developed uh, very early. Uh, there are those who say, well, it, it wasn't done until a Constantine or a Pope or somebody like that. But uh, it seems to have been uh, started early in, in the Christian observance. Uh, after all, Jesus rose from the dead on the first day of the week. And in a very real sense, now we are celebrating His resurrection. Uh, Pentecost, when the church began, was on the first day of the week. And so, uh, uh, there were, and then, then Paul speaks about uh, receiving an offering in the church on the first day of the week. And so early in New Testament times, uh, the, the brethren uh, gathered on the first day of the week. That is what we call Sunday. So I think it was very, very early in uh, the uh, church's experience. Uh, okay. <clears throat> now we had uh, gotten down to the last uh, few verses of chapter 11. And there was this prophecy about a big famine all across the Roman Empire. But it was going to especially uh, impact upon Israel and Judea, and especially upon Jerusalem, and especially upon the Jewish believers in Jerusalem. So the believers in Antioch, the members of the congregation there, of the church, uh, decided to send a contribution, a relief fund, to the saints in Jerusalem. This is the first, first uh, uh, in, in instance of uh, the churches uh, sending funds to the saints in Jerusalem. But it's not the last time, yes. Why it is that if the famine was going to be all over the inhabitable world, why only for Jerusalem? The question is, if the famine was all over the Roman Empire, why uh, were they concerned particularly about uh, Jerusalem? Uh, one thing about uh, uh, Israel is that it is an arid country. If it doesn't have rain, it is in more shape than in countries that have big rivers and, and uh, so forth flowing through them, like the Nile or the Euphrates and uh, the Tigris and so forth and so on. 
So Jerusalem is particularly affected by a drought and famine. And that may be one reason why this is the case. But as far as the Jewish believers there, they were under more stress than the ordinary population in Jerusalem because of uh, persecution and uh, things of this nature. Yes? Well, I was just going to start. I was thinking that the people that had some kind of wherewithal were probably the ones that left. So they, they were not in Jerusalem. The ones that couldn't afford to go anywhere would be the ones that really had the hardest time and they were no longer connected with all the Jewish systems of alms and take care of the widows and all that kind of stuff. Uh, the comment is that uh, it's possible that the Jewish believers who were more well off were the ones who left and leaving the ones in Jerusalem who uh, did not have the wherewithal. That's possible. Well, for instance, Barnabas was from Cyprus, and he was there and uh, then left. And maybe he's a, an example of uh, some of the others. At any rate, the saints in Jerusalem were in dire straits, and uh, the church in Antioch took, took up an offering for their purposes. Uh, chapter 12. Now about that time, Herod the king stretched out his hand to harass some from the church. Herod, my goodness. We've, we've had Herod's name all the way through uh, the New Testament, haven't we? Uh, Herod the Great. This is not Herod the Great. Uh, Herod Antipas. And now Herod Agrippa the first sort of a great grandson I think of Herod the Great uh, but anyway their, their names are all the way through the New Testament from, from the uh, from the uh, Gospels right on through Acts and so forth now this is Herod Agrippa and he was actually called king and he had uh, rulership over all of Judea and Galilee and uh, all that the whole land of Israel, just about like his great granddaddy did. But he was going to harass some from the church. Well, he's uh, taken a few pa uh, a page from uh, his Herod the Great. Then he killed James, the brother of John, with a sword. Now, this is James, the brother of John, you know, the two the two brothers that Jesus called the sons of thunder. Uh, he was one of the original apostles. Now, the James who wrote the book of James was a different man. He was also, he was the brother, the half-brother of Jesus. That is, they had the same mother, but uh, God was Jesus' father and Joseph was James' father. At any rate, James, the pastor of the church in Jerusalem, uh, is a, is a different James than this one. But this was one of the original disciples and, and apostles. Verse 3, And because he saw that it pleased the Jews, uh, boy, we got rid of uh, that James guy. He was a problem. Uh, he was preaching the, uh, this heretical doctrine about Jesus of Nazareth. He's gone. So it pleased the Jews, that is, the Jewish leaders and, and the majority. Of course, not, not the Jewish believers in Christ. He proceeded further to seize Peter also. Well, got rid of James. That made him happy. Let's take the chief of the apostles of Peter and we'll make him more happy. Now, it was during the days of unleavened bread. When is that? Passover. Passover week. Yeah. <clears throat> So, when he had arrested him, Peter, he put him in prison and delivered him to four squads of soldiers to keep him, intending to bring him before the people after Passover. Not, but says Easter. Easter, yes. Uh, that's in the King James, the old King James, says Easter. Uh, but the Greek word there is Pascha. It is definitely Passover. Uh, but the King James translators, early ones, uh, wanted to have Easter somewhere in the Bible, and so they translated Passover Easter. 
Go figure. Uh, now, the, uh, he had four squads of soldiers. And uh, that was a whole bunch of soldiers. Now, why in the world would they feel it was necessary to have four squads of soldiers watching Peter? Well, he got out of prison. Of prison. He got, he'd already gotten out of prison before when the Sanhedrin had him. And he, they'd had rumors about this guy. And uh, so they were going to make sure that he didn't escape. Little did they know. All right. Verse 5. Peter was therefore kept in prison, but constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. The church there in Jerusalem was praying for Peter. Praying that he'd be released. Praying that he would be uh, kept strong. Praying for boldness. Praying for all kinds of things for Peter. And when Herod was about to bring him out, the Passover was about there, that night Peter was sleeping. Uh, that's nice. Peter's sleeping. Here you have four squads of soldiers and, and Herod uh, Agrippa was just about to bring him out the next day to be executed. And he's, <laughs> he's, he's sleeping. So that's the peace of the Lord, is it not? And uh, bound with two chains between two soldiers. How's that? Chain to the soldiers. And the guards before the door were keeping the prisoner. The prison. Everything was locked tight. Nobody was going to escape. It was uh, uh, total security. The best security that the Roman uh, government could provide. Now behold, an angel of the Lord stood by him, and a light shone in the prison. And he struck Peter on the side and raised him up. He was so asleep that the light there and the angel standing there didn't wake him up. It took a slap on the side from the angel. I wonder what that feels like. Uh, to wake him up. saying, Arise quickly. And his chains <laughs> fell off his hands. <laughs> just opened up. They were all locked up, secured, and they just fell off. What were the soldiers doing all this time? <laughs> Not anything. And then the angel said to him, Gird yourself, and tie on your sandals. And so he did. He's having to instruct Peter how to get the dress here. Tie on your sandals. And so he did. And he said to him, put on your garment and follow me. I mean, <clears throat> we, we learned later that Peter thought he was in a, in a vision. He thought he was in a, a, a trance of some kind. He'd had those experiences before. Wasn't he in a trance when he saw the, the sheep coming down? I guess he felt he was in some kind of a, a, a vision or something like that and didn't think it was real. In fact, he tells us that later. But uh, uh, So the, the angel is having to instruct him about getting dressed. So he went out and followed him and did not know what was done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. When they were past the first and second guard posts, they came to the iron gate that leads to the city, which opened to them of its own accord. It's like a seeing eye, you know, these eye things that you go up to the door and it just opens up. And that's what the, this gate did. It just opened up uh, of its own accord. And they went out and went down one street. They got a block down the road. And immediately the angel departed from him. And when Peter had come to himself, he was still kind of in a dream. He was in a, a stupor. He was kind of in a vision. He didn't, he didn't realize exactly what was going on until the angel left him and he looked around. He was out of the prison and he's 
didn't have any shackles on and he uh, came to himself. Hey, this is real. Now I know for certain that the Lord has sent His angel and has delivered me from the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the Jewish people. This is real. I'm free. I'm out of prison. And they can't touch me right now. Anyway. So, when he had considered this, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark. This is all in Jerusalem there. Where many were gathered together praying. And what were they praying about? Peter. Peter. <laughs> Lord, please free Peter. Save him from this. Don't let the same thing happen to him as happened to James. And as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a girl named Rhoda came to answer. Now, the way they explain this is that there was sort of a courtyard out in front of the house, and then there was a, a, a sort of a, a door to the courtyard. So here, Peter was banging on the door of the outer courtyard there, and uh, Rhoda comes up, uh, to answer the door. And when she recognized Peter's voice because of her gladness, she did not open the gate. <laughs> but ran and announced, but ran in and announced that Peter stood before the gate. Yeah. This is definite humor. Humorous. This is really humorous. He got Peter escaped from prison. He he was in a stupor a part of the time. He came to his senses, realized that it was for real. He bangs on the gate uh, where uh, the church is meeting, the house where the church is meeting. And uh, this girl comes out and won't, won't let him in. But they said to her, you are beside yourself. You're crazy. Well, what have they been praying about? Lord... Release Peter! And there he was standing at the door and they didn't believe the girl when, when she told him that he was out there. Yes. Oh, uh, I read somewhere where uh, it uh, was suggested that uh, maybe Peter was in a, uh, sleeping and relaxed because the Lord had said that uh, uh, you're, you're going to be uh, old. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The Lord Jesus made the yeah. promise to him, when, you know, when you're old, I will take you and lead you where you don't want to go. So maybe he was not old yet, so he had some confidence that he was, his time was not yet. Yeah, that's, that's, that is a possibility. Yeah, part of the reason why he was uh, there. Question, the point is that uh, Peter had been promised by Jesus that he would go old, grow old and then would die in a way that he didn't want to die. Uh, but he wasn't old yet. I don't know exactly how old he was, probably in his 40s or something by, by now, but that's not really very old. And uh, so uh, perhaps because of that promise, he knew that he was protected. At any rate, now he's there at the gate, knocking on the, on the gate, the door. Uh, and, and they all said she was crazy. Yet she kept insisting that it wasn't that it was so, and they said, "It is his angel." Whoa, what is this? They talking about ghosts? Yeah. Uh, A well, <laughs> according to the commentaries and so forth, uh, 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 there was a thought among the Jewish people that uh, every everybody had an, an angel, especially every Jew had an angel. And uh, I don't know whether it was a guardian angel or what concept that was, but they may even look like uh, the person. Uh, so maybe they were reflecting that, uh, that uh, idea. Uh, uh, it may be uh, like, a, like a ghost or something, but, but Peter wasn't dead, so yeah, uh, it's his angel. Now, Peter continued knocking. He was still out there at the front, knocking on the door, knocking on the door, knocking on the door. <laughs> and this girl had come and, and ran away from <laughs> And when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. Was that prayer or 
thing? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> then, then, then the Lord answer their prayer? <laughs> but motioning to them with his hand to keep silent, he declared to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, Go, tell these things to James. This is James, the brother of Jesus, the pastor of the Jerusalem church, and to the brethren. Let him know. I'm free. And he departed and went to another place. What other place? Well, some other house in Jerusalem, some other city. At any rate, he lay low, as it were. Then as soon as it was day, there was uh, verse uh, 14, uh, excuse me, 18 here. Then as soon as it was day, there was no small stir among the soldiers about what had become of Peter. That sounds like understatement. Yeah, no, no, <laughs> no small stir. <laughs> but when Herod had searched for him and not found him, he examined the guards and commanded that they should be put to death. Wow. That was, there was a bunch of soldiers, remember. Four squads. Be put to death. They let the prisoner escape. And he went down from Judea to Caesarea and stayed there. So, as far as Herod, was, Herod Agrippa was concerned, uh, it was the soldiers had failed in their job and let this guy escape. Probably with some help from the outside. Yeah. Uh, but there, there was another uh, angelic miracle for Peter. <clears throat> and then the death of Herod Agrippa the first. Verse 20, 20. Now Herod had been very angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon up there in Phoenicia. But they came to him with one accord. Not that's not a Honda. That was they came down in, in uh, uh, agreement. agreement. Yes, uh, and having made Blastus the king's personal aide, their friend, they got in with the top people there uh, with the uh, one of the chief personal aides of King Herod Agrippa. They asked for peace because their country was supplied by, with food by the king's country. In other words, uh, probably the Sharon Valley and the, and the Jezreel Valley, the bed baskets of Israel, were supplying uh, food to Phoenicia, Tyre and Sidon. They didn't want to have trouble with Herod Agrippa. So on a day set, uh, so on a set day, Herod stayed in his royal apparel, arrayed in his royal apparel, sat on his throne, and gave an oration to them. I wonder what that oration was. I mean, goodness, it was just a powerful speech he gave to them, and the people kept shouting, "The voice of a god and not of man." The voice of a God and not of a man. And uh, apparently, uh, Herod was uh, basking in this adulation uh, that he was receiving from the people and their worship, as it were, that he was a God. Then immediately an angel of the Lord struck him because he did not give glory to God. And he was eaten by worms and died. So be careful of adulation. <laughs> it can be dangerous to your health. Uh, especially receiving. And if you get it, give glory to God. Uh... But he didn't, and uh, he died from worms. And uh, this is confirmed in Josephus, by the way, in uh, secular history, uh, that this actually happened. And it was a terrible death. 
verse 24, but the word of God grew and multiplied. And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their ministry. And uh, they also took with them John, whose surname was Mark. So uh, apparently, uh, Paul and Barnabas were around when all this was happening. Uh, they were in Jerusalem, but of course, uh, Herod Agrippa was in Caesarea. And uh, they take you there in Caesarea today, and they show you the amph amphitheater where uh, they, they believe that Herod Agrippa made his astonishing speech and then died. Um, and uh, Paul and Barnabas had, had delivered their uh, contribution from the Antioch church to the saints in Jerusalem and uh, then went back to Antioch. And they took with them Mark, who enters into the history here of uh, the early church. And of course, he's the one that wrote the book of Mark, the gospel of Mark. And of course, it was at his home where Peter came, you know, where his mother was, uh, and and knock, was knocking on the door. And that's where the church met. So uh, he had an early exposure to the gospel. And it's believed that Mark was the young man in Mark's gospel who ran away from the arrest scene the rest of Jesus. Naked. They grabbed his cloak and he ran away naked. Early exposure? Uh, yes. Uh, early exposure. And and uh, he got home though. Well, now we're introduced to him again and he becomes part of the missionary team of Paul and Barnabas. Yes? Uh, my understanding is that uh, Mark uh, later on became quite a prominent pastor in North Africa. He Anything about that? Uh, the question is, did Mark uh, later become a prominent pastor in, in uh, North Africa? That's tradition. We don't know. Uh, it could be. He did become uh, a help to Paul. And uh, in, in 2 Timothy, Paul mentions Mark as being very profitable to him. Whereas before, he had been unprofitable to Paul. Uh, and... It's believed that Mark was most closely associated uh, in the later time with Peter and that his gospel reflects the presentation that Peter made uh, of, the, of the gospels, uh, of the gospel account, uh, and, that, and that Mark sort of acted as, as Peter's secretary in recording the, uh, the gospel. Uh, as far as North Africa is concerned, that tradition may be true. We, we don't know. It's not in the scriptures, of course, but in a later uh, history. Chapter 13. Now, uh, now, in the church that was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers. Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger. It's believed that Simeon called Niger. That was his nickname. And uh, he was a, a man from Africa. And he was, he was a black Jewish believer. Perhaps a Philosian. Uh, maybe an Ethiopian. Uh, Lucius of Cyrene, who, which is also from North Africa. Manan who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, that is, Herod Antipas. He was a childhood friend of Herod Antipas. He had been <coughs> raised up with him. Uh, well, there are not many wise, not many noble that are called, but there are a few. And here was uh, somebody who was uh, of high station that was uh, with the church there in Antioch. And Saul, Saul was considered a prophet as well as a, uh, and teacher as well as an apostle. 
as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Uh, somehow, uh, pro perhaps through the, one of the prophets, or somehow the Holy Spirit gave them to understand that they were to separate Paul and Barnabas for the work. And, uh, of course, this resulted in the first missionary journey. Then, having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away. They commissioned them as missionaries. These were, this was really the first commissioned missionaries uh, that we read about. Uh, in other words, it was deliberate. It wasn't a result of persecution and being scattered around and everything, going back home to where and, and so forth. They were specifically sent out by the church uh, under the authority of the Holy Spirit uh, for a missionary enterprise. So being sent out, verse 4, by the Holy Spirit, uh, they went down to Seleucus, and from there they sail, sailed to Cyprus. Seleucus was the port of Antioch. And um, uh, that's where they uh, wound up in Cyprus. Now, why would they go to Cyprus? Well, that was uh, where Barnabas was from. You know, one of the two, Paul and Barnabas. Uh, and that was his home town, home country, home island. So uh, they decided to go there first. And when they, uh, besides that, it was close by. And when they arrived in Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogue of the Jews. They also had John as their assistant. Now, here we begin to see a evangelistic pattern that the Apostle Paul had. When he got into a new city, a new territory, the first thing he did was to go to the Jewish people. And where were the Jewish people? In the synagogues. By the way, where did, where did the word synagogue come from? Uh, it means gather together. And it is not a Hebrew word, it's a Greek word. Synagogos. Uh, but it was, uh, they began the synagogues called Knesset. Where have you heard Knesset before? That's the parliament of the Jews. Uh, the Jewish, in Hebrew, a synagogue is called a Knesset. Uh, and in Greek, it's a synagogos or a synagogue. But that's where the Jews gathered on the Sabbath day, on the seventh day of the week. And, uh, Paul evangelized the synagogues. Uh, well, I thought he was the apostle to the Gentiles. Yes, he was. But he was also to bear witness to the people of Israel. And his methodology was to the Jews first and also to the Gentiles. And where better to find Jews than in the synagogue? Yes. Uh, should we assume that that should be the pattern of modern missionaries now? Well, I have often wondered about that. Would you repeat the question, please? The question was, should that be the pattern of modern evangelism today? Uh, frankly, I don't see why not. I don't think there's been any dispensational change uh, since the ministry of the Apostle Paul. Now, what we have here, of course, not, not, every, uh, not every apostle did this, though. We don't read of Peter going into the synagogues. And he was the apostle to the Jews. Um, I'm not sure we read of any of the other apostles doing this. We read of Apollos doing it. Uh, what were the qualifications of Paul? He was a Hebrew of the Hebrews, a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He had been, he'd studied in the yeshiva, uh, the seminary of uh, Gamaliel. He had high credentials. And normally, when a rabbi of any such qualifications as that was traveling around, and they did travel around, uh, they were invited to speak in the synagogue. Here, oh, hey, 
here's so and so from Jerusalem, uh, from Gamaliel, or from somewhere else. Uh, let's hear a sermon from him. And let him speak of the Torah and, and the prophets. And so there was a custom like that, and Paul readily fitted into that uh, milieu. And so it was a very natural thing for him to be there. Of course, he had a ministry there for a while, found some believers, people who did believe, uh, and then most did not believe, and they got rid of it. The next city did the same thing all over again. But you see, by this methodology, Paul was able to go into a city, stay there maybe for three weeks, as he did in some places, and leave, <laughs> usually being run out of town, but leave with a, a church established, composed of believing Jews and believing Gentiles, who had some understanding of the Scriptures already. And so they were able to hold together and grow and develop. And that's the way the churches were planted. Sometimes with just a few weeks of ministry. That sounds like a pretty powerful methodology to me. Uh, I have talked to uh, Jewish believers about doing this. And uh, most are, are not interested at all in doing that. They're, they're rather afraid. There's a phrase in the, in, the, in the Gospels called the fear of the Jews. And they're afraid. Well, what will happen to me? Uh, and um, I, have, um, I have even made arrangements for the Jewish believers to go. Some well-trained and well-schooled to go into the synagogue and proclaim Jesus. Even had them invited. And they said, no, no. And I would go with them. And I would be behind them. Way behind them. But, <laughs> but I would be there with them. So, uh, for... For some 40, 50 years of ministry, I have looked for this and have not found it. At any rate, uh, Paul was unique, though. He, he really was unusual. But what a, and, and, and this is how the apostle to the Gentiles reached Gentiles. By getting the gospel to the Jews... They got stirred up either believing believing in Christ or not believing in Christ. They were stirred up one way or another. And through them, the gospel went out to the community. Very interesting methodology. And uh, frankly, I don't think it has been uh, surpassed. Now, when they had gone through the island, verse 6, to Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar-Jesus, who was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, an intelligent man. This man called for Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. He was a ruler in, in Paphos, in Cyprus. Yes. Roman? He was a Roman, Gentile, yes. And uh, he, he heard about what Paul and Barnabas were doing, and he said, bring him here, I want to hear him. But his assistant, uh, Elimus, uh didn't want them to come, and stood in the way. But Elimus the sorcerer, for so his name is translated, withstood them seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. Then Saul, who is also called Paul, now is the first time we got his name Paul. Now that was not a new name for him, but that was his Gentile name, probably from early his birth. Saul in the synagogue, Paul in Tarsus. 
filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, O oh, full of all deceit and fraud, you son of the devil. Hey, this is a real politically correct uh, <laughs> diplomatic uh, discussion here. O oh, full of deceit and all fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, you will not cease perver when you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord. You're twisting everything. And now indeed the hand of the Lord is upon you and you shall be blind. Not seeing the sun for a time. And immediately a dark mist fell on him and he went around seeking someone to lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had been done, being astonished at the teaching of the Lord. It was the teaching of the Lord that astonished him as much as, if not more, than the miracle that he saw. Now when Paul and his party set sail from Paphos, they came to Perga in Pamphylia, and John departed from them, returned to Jerusalem. He left them. He went home. Nobody knows why. It's not told. But Paul was furious that he had deserted them. But when they, verse 14, But when they departed from Perga, they came to Antioch in Pisidia. Now this is another Antioch. It's in the middle of what we know as Turkey today, Asia Minor. And went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. Where we heard that before. They went into the synagogue. And after the reading of the law and the prophets, and that's what is done every Sabbath in the synagogue. The law, the Torah is read, and then the prophets. The rulers of the synagogue sent to them, saying, Men and brethren, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, say on. And uh, that will conclude our archived uh, portion of the 